Should the Jazz take a wing or a guard at nine? And then what do the Jazz do at 16? Find out what Danny Ainge and the Jazz Brain Trust must contemplate next on Locked On Jazz. You are Locked On Jazz, your daily podcast on the Utah Jazz. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name's Leif Tuline, and I'm excited and honored to have the opportunity to talk with you guys, fill in for David Locke on Locked On Jazz the next few weeks on Locked On Jazz. I'm a lifelong Utah Jazz fan who's a credentialed NBA draft analyst for Locked On NBA Big Board, attendee of the 2023 NBA Combine, Utah Jazz broadcast assistant and statistician the past two seasons, and lover of college basketball. So don't expect all the geeky numbers of usual to be gone but I'll bring a unique perspective as a diehard college hoops fan, NBA draft analyst, and a jazz employee and a fan to make you guys as knowledgeable as possible about your Utah jazz as we head to a critical juncture in jazz franchise history with three draft picks this year and plenty in the future. Thanks for making Locked On Jazz your first listen every day. And remember, Locked On Jazz is free and available on all platforms, including YouTube at Locked On Jazz, where the best way to help us grow is comment anything below and today's question is which wing is your favorite prospect for the jazz and why and i'll try my best to engage with you on there thanks to game time for sponsoring the show today where you can find fast affordable and great seats in no time check out game time for some tickets in the near future near you and hopefully see you there in the first segment i'll outline three different strategies the jazz will weigh when drafting ninth and 16th with a thought on who will be available among wings at nine and guards at 16. In the second segment, I'll break down which guards are in play at nine and which wings are in play at 16 and why that is an important strategy to weigh. In the final segment, I'll analyze the draft strategy that relies nothing on fit, not at all, and is just best player available, strictly picking off the Jazz's board, regardless of redundancy. And lastly, I'll give my verdict on which team Uh, which I deem to be the best option knowing to their draft inside and out the jazz. And I have just got back from the combine and there are a lot of prospects that are in the possibility for the jazz without trading. Imagine if there's trades, but we'll take it from the perspective that there are no trades. The jazz are at nine and 16 and of course, 28, but we're going to focus on those first two and who could be critical players for the jazz in the near future. The Jazz find themselves in a bit of a crossroads where the Jazz, where the franchise expects to be good and content. And the Jazz overachieved this past year in what was supposed to be a rebuilding year. But in doing so, the Jazz drew the ninth pick, which is a good pick, but not one littered with franchise changing talents available, which is typically what hope of a rebuild is. But, and there is a huge but, the Jazz have now two cornerstones in the, on their roster for the foreseeable future in Lowry Markin and Walker Kessler. And they have three draft picks this year and loads more in years to come. So what do the Jazz do in 2023 with the draft regarded as a good one with picks 9 and 16? The lottery, to me, favors wings, which is what the NBA in modern day favors as well. Which is, So that's not a surprise. But the Jazz, in terms of current roster construction, are more in need of a lead guard. So that begs the question, to select a wing or a guard at 9. And what makes that question of it, is there a guard? What makes a question of it? Is, is there a guard at nine that you really are feel confident enough that makes makes their the Jazz feel like you have to take a guard? Or do you take the team, the position with more depth, which is, uh, which is wing, in my opinion, at number nine? And then at 16, what players are available? So I'll analyze that. In my opinion, uh, as the everydayers learned yesterday, there are four possibilities at nine who I think classify as wings that the Jazz should take a deep look at. Uh, those players are Cam Whitmore, Jarris Walker, Taylor Hendricks, and G.G. Jackson. You could make an argument for Kansas shooting specialist Grady Dick to be selected as a wing candidate as well, and maybe overtime elite shooting guard Osar Thompson, who I think is almost a point guard, which is why I hesitate to put him in a category which I actually think is a good thing, but not for delineating these prospects. I expect Jarris Walker and Cam Whitmore to be selected before night, and if I had to guess on this date of May 23rd, I guess either Taylor Hendricks or Osar Thompson has gone before ninth as well, but probably not all of them. I, this is just what like my presumption is. It does not mean I am correct. I wish, I wish that was always the case, but it, it certainly doesn't mean that. Um, 
Whitmore and Walker are both rare athletes, and which is why I, I think that they're the most likely to be gone. So so is Amen Thompson. Uh, I, I'll start with Whitmore and Walker. They're both rare athletes who couple power with scoring touch and big rugged bodies. Jarris Walker from Houston could be one of the best players in the draft. He has the scoring chops. He was not able to display or demonstrate at Houston, and it's possible he does at the minimum. will be a very good defender who can pass and shoot to a respectable degree. So that's a high floor and potential to erupt with a high ceiling. If he's there, I would be very shocked if the Jazz select someone different at number nine. Much of the same could be said about Cam Whitmore. Cam Whitmore is someone I expect to score well at the NBA level from all three levels, coupling a sweet shooting touch, which in the stats that I referenced for the everyday or yesterday, basically say he's an excellent shooter, a 90th percentile shooter, a 90th percentile finisher, someone from the catch and shoot that is regarded as excellent and trans transition. He's regarded as very good. And in the mid range, he's regarded as excellent. So that's the three level score with athleticism to boot uh, in a big rugged body at six, six two thirty five with a 40.5 inch vertical. And he's got pretty good finishing skills. I think it was very good in that department, about 77th percentile, if I, if I remember correctly. So I also doubt he's there, but you know what? Uh, the combine may have not been kind to him in terms of measurements and measurements. He, he came in at six, six basically. And with only a six, eight wingspan and some people really buy into that. So we'll see. Uh, I personally expect Osar Thompson to be already selected by the ninth due to his athletic upside potential with the ball in his hands to create for others and a floor of just out of this world athleticism and capacity to tenaciously defend the wing at the NBA. He's six foot seven and he's 218 pounds ready to defend already. And, is regarded as a poor shooter, but he is a good player. Um, so I think if one of those three is available, I'd expect them to be selected by the Jazz. I doubt any of those three are available. To me, the sheer numbers of positional depth favors the Jazz going for a wing at nine in lieu of taking a, a of one of the likely two guards that are associated with this pick so frequently at Anthony Black and Cason Wallace. So the guards who can be in play at 16 is now a question because like we've discussed yesterday on the show, the Jazz's main deficiency on their roster building is a point guard because they have uh, Colin Sexton and Ochag Baji are both guards, but neither of whom are, are who the Jazz want to play their point guard. The Jazz have a big in Walker Kessler. The Jazz have a wing in Lowry Markkinen. But I don't think it's redundant to take another wing who seamlessly fits between those two big, bigger players in Lowry Markkinen and Walker Kessler. And I think there's a lot of positional depth at 16 in the guard spot. And that's where I'd target a guard. The guards who could be in play here are Baylor's Keontae George, Indiana's Jalen hood Shafino, Michigan's Kobe Bufkin, and Arkansas's Nick Smith Jr. While most of, there, there's a fairly good likelihood not all of them are available, there's a good chance that most some of them are. I'd guess two of the four are available, would even lean toward three of them being available, depending on some some medicals and some workout news that we'll hear rumbling of. So who are they? All four of them have decent size, even good size for a point guard, and some of them present serious scoring upside. Keontae George being prime among them as he sizzled the nets of Wintrust Arena in front of me and so many other people from the NBA as he had the best shooting performance of any pro day I witnessed. He lost weight that he deemed unnecessary when he played with Baylor, recovered from an ankle injury that slowed him down for March Madness, where I saw him live and actually was quite critical of him uh, for his kind of moping around the court and lack of explosiveness, lack of ability to get open. But he showed that he was trying to do point guard oriented drills. And I think that's what's going to help him is he shoots that well and he wants the rock in his hands. Uh, so I wonder if he, someone will take him to develop into a point guard rather than just a scoring two guard. Jalen Huchafino went to Montverde and then to Indiana, relatively off NBA radars when he came into Indiana, but scored 35 on number one Purdue's home court and scores in ways very conducive to the NBA game, punishing drop coverage as he scores in the mid range at an elite level. And he's got a big body, six foot six, 217 pounds, and isn't overly reliant on athleticism, which means his game should age well as he develops more understanding of how to run a pick and roll. I think he's a guy that will rise up boards as teams see more and more of him. Kobe Bufkin has been among the largest risers from the mid-year onward and is revered as Michigan's best prospect by most, despite Jet Howard's start. And Jet Howard's start was sizzling. 
Bufkin is a 19-year-old sophomore who doesn't have one unreal skill, but is good at everything and analytically checks boxes for shooting and athleticism, measuring in excellent in some and very good in most anything else that regards shooting or athleticism. So think of rim finishing transition for athleticism and isolation, and then shooting is spot up, catch and shoot, both cat uh, guarded and unguarded, and he checks all those boxes. Nick Smith Jr. was many people's favorite to be the top collegiate player selected, but I've never really liked his game as he relies heavily on finesse and guile and tough shot making. Um, but his talent is undeniable. The questions are injury related. He missed much of the season for Arkansas with knee and foot issues. And then can he really run the point? Anthony Black, a, a presumptive lottery pick, really ran the point guard. So can he run the point guard? Uh, the talent is there. So there's four players that are guards at 16. And you can make an argument for like Bryce Sensabaugh or Derek Whitehead, who I'll touch on later in this episode, as being guards as well, neither of whom are point guards. So I think all four of those guys, though, can play the point guard. Some of them are more of combo guards you'd like to sculpt, you'd like to mold into point guards. But I think there's positional depth for the guards in the mid, uh, mid 10 to 20 range, just outside the lottery where the Jazz are. So I would lean to take a guard uh, at 16 and a wing at nine. Best player available could dictate something. So I'll get to that as well. Coming up next, I'll break down Casey Wallace and Anthony Black and what other guards could be considered at nine and which wings are in play at 16 and why this is an important strategy to weigh for the Jazz's needs here. But first, let me tell you about game time. Game time is something that I wish I'd found a lot sooner. Uh, I'm a avid sports fan. Like you hear me talk about the Jazz. I, I'm on a college basketball show. I, I game buying tickets shouldn't be stressful, but it has been. Game time is fast and easy, and it's it's a way to buy sports tickets, music, comedy, and theater near you. If you're like me and love sports, it can be stressful to put together plans with friends. Like I went to March Madness this year and the year before. And some of the planning in terms of ticket buying and hotels, way too strenuous. If I knew about game time, I would have saved a lot of stress then. Uh, it would have saved me quite the hassle. Game time provides easy to find and easy to buy tickets for every kind of event in your area with images of seat views. That would have been a lifesaver because we ended up getting seats that were worse than we thought. And, you, and they're pretty strict about your seating. So game time can save you there. You can get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more, which can be a lifesaver. Snag the tickets without the stress on game time. Download the game time app, create an account, and use Locked On NBA, L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N-N-B-A for $20 off on your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, Create the account and redeem code locked on MBA for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute, last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Welcome back into Locked On Jazz. I'm Leaf Tulane, and we spoke about going a wing at nine and guard at 16. So let's discuss the opposite, meaning picking a guard at nine and a wing at 16, and what players fit these labels who could be available for the Jazz at the two different slots. The obvious two guards that have been discussed ad nauseum for the Jazz are Anthony Black, the long, rangy, rim-attacking guard from Arkansas who has defensive chops, and the other is Cason Wallace of Kentucky who has been likened to Drew Holiday, Marcus Smart for his point, attack, point of attack defense and ability to score in spot-ups and being able to score in the mid-range with this sweet, smooth mid-range jump shot coming off screens. If you missed yesterday's lock, uh, installment of Locked on Jazz, I spoke in depth about the pair of these two guards, and I recommend you guys check that out. The everydayers, let me know what you think. Uh, the third guard available at nine, I mentioned briefly as a wing, but I'll give a pitch for him as a guard, and that is Osar Thompson. Like I said earlier, there's a bit of devil's advocate, but I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to fit both boxes. I think that's actually a good thing in the way the NBA is played today. Osar Thompson is the brother of likely top four pick Amen Thompson. Well, his brother is lauded for tremendous athleticism and coupling with good pick and roll reads aided by the driving prowess. Osar is less experienced playing the one due to playing alongside his brother and that position belonging to his brother. But I believe in time, Osar could be a good orchestrator of the offense and he would step in immediately and be one of the best on ball defenders in the NBA. So that's something to explore for the jazz. Should he be available? And if he doesn't have the point point guard chops, his floor is aided by defensive acumen and physical traits you can't teach. There's risk involved, though, because he 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 played significantly inferior competition in overtime elite, 
and he's 20 years old. So, and he doesn't shoot well. The reason I bring this up, well, I still think he'll be picked before pick nine or, or around pick nine is because if you're going to bank on someone to have a high floor defensively, you're not seeing too many players right now playing the NBA playoffs, which is the goal of the of when you draft. You're drafting to win playoff games. You're not drafting to say, oh, this guy can get up individual stats. I think Osar Thompson, if he plays the one, will have a bit of a learning curve to learn how to play the point guard. The Jazz may be able to find a way to uh, limit those issues by having supplementary ball handlers. But if he's able to hit and be a true point guard with that type of defensive upside, that's the stuff that can elevate you from one round of the playoffs to the next with a team that's got a really nice roster construction with the Jazz are really starting to put together. Uh, the fact he doesn't shoot it well doesn't concern me that much if he's a point guard because they'll have the ball in his hands. It's a bit concerning if he's playing the two or the three because then where do you hide him? Do you, does he play like Isaac Okoro? And that significantly limits his upside. All three of these guards I just mentioned have defense as their main immediate calling cards with Case and Wallace having the most individual scoring potential due to better shooting ability than the other two. But he does have the issue of being the by far the smallest of the trio of point of attack defending guards, which could, you know, who could run the ship for the Jazz as the point guard. Now that leads to the question of if the Jazz ought to take one of these three at nine or any other guard for that matter, who is available at 16 that the Jazz should be interested in? If the Jazz go into guard at nine, I fully expect them to draft a wing or even somewhat closer to a big at 16, barring someone slipping more than I can foresee like Keontae George. I don't think he falls to 16, but if he does, it might be hard to pass on him. Uh, the Jazz have said they'll prioritize athleticism, length, and versatility. So that means to me they won't pass on getting bigger and better at stopping the position that's been the most valuable in the NBA for the past number of years in the big ball handlers' scores, a la KD, Jimmy Butler, Jason Tatum, and obviously LeBron James, too. At 16, the wings I foresee being potentially available are 18-year-old Gigi Jackson from South Carolina. We discussed a bit yesterday as someone who I think his combine stock fell, but previously it was drawing lottery eyes, so 16 is very much in play. Uh, Leonard Miller, 19-year-old from the G League Ignite, and he's someone I'm very, very high on. I have him in my lottery on my big board. We'll get to him. Possibly Grady Dick from Kansas. Should he still be there at 16? Sharpshooter from Kansas, who's got some size, uh, lacks on-ball creation, but is a one of the better shooters in the class. Noah Clowney from Alabama, also a freshman. Ohio State's Bryce Sensabaugh, though there is an argument he's a guard with a big body. And Derek Whitehead, who also could, you could also say, has played guard, but would be more of a wing in the NBA. But he is also nursing an injury. I've long targeted guys like Leonard Miller and Noah Clowney for the Jazz's high floor energy players that are young, that rebound, and have budding offensive games that can be cultivated and molded because I think they'll likely be there. But I will say I doubt Grady Dick and maybe Gigi Jackson will be there with pick 16 for the opposite reasons. Grady Dick is a ready to shoot the ball on a team and more plug and play, but in my opinion returns little upside as he's an okay athletic like as he has okay athletic testing sets, but he doesn't strike me as a good athlete while watching him play. And I think he's a bit one dimensional. He's a great shooter who does not impact the game defensively nor off the bounce. Gigi Jackson is the opposite. He will likely not be ready for a while, but has tremendous upside about as high as any player that could be selected outside the top four. But at 16, you often expect quick returns as those teams are hoping to contend. And that's why the Jazz are fortunate to be ahead of schedule uh, with assets to boot. Gigi Jackson could definitely be worth the swing here if available, despite relatively underwhelming shooting at the combine at his pro day. Um, I think the Jazz are in a good spot here because they're ahead of the teams that usually pick here, like the T-Wolves. They're a team that wants to be contending further in the playoffs rather than getting bounced in the first round. The Jazz are rebuilding, but now have multiple picks and ha have a ability to, to grow. Back to Clowney and Miller, both of whom are thin, rangy athletes who have the capacity to play the four, despite limited uh, success shooting the ball, uh, have found a way to really impact the game. I think each can effectively play the small ball five in backup units for the Jazz, and due to absolutely phenomenal rebounding instincts and activity. Clowney was a nine-rebound-a-game guy on Alabama who had Brandon Miller and Charles Bidiaco, so that's the biggest front court in America, as well as a couple bigs and the backups that played serious minutes and Pringle. So I, I really do think Clowney could be a five at the NBA level, but you could also play him at the four. That's versatility and defensive orient uh, into itself. 
And he also did this on the best team in the country throughout most of the season. They didn't win the championship, but Alabama was probably the best team throughout the, the season. Clowney, uh, he did so anchoring with, with a big name, Charles Bediaco, who anchored the middle, played out of position, learned how to slide his feet, make himself more valuable. And instead of, he became kind of a dare shooter. And he wasn't great from three, but he, he could make them. And the shot looks good. I do think he's going to be here for the Jazz. This is someone I really would strongly consider. Same could be said for Leonard Miller. I walked by him tons of times at the combine, and he is huge. He's got the Kawhi type of build. Leonard Miller dominated games against pros this year. Uh, he did so with rebounding. He did so running the floor, scoring on the interior. His shot's a little janky. It's got a lefty little hitch, and it's flat. But he showed good touch, shot at the star drill, shot 60% from three. That's something to, to watch for. And then – he had a 30 and 18 game and he finished the season with multiple 20 and 10 games against grown men as a 19 year old. I think Leonard Miller would be a great pick for the jazz at 16. One I'd strongly advocate for Miller fits into the Kawhi type of build. Like I said, he's a little thinner than Patrick Williams, Tari Eason, Kawhi Leonard, OG Ananobi. Those are the only guys who fit the same measurements as Kawhi Leonard with long arms, the seven, two or greater wingspan, six, seven or taller. And, uh, they they have big hands like it, it's a rare rare mold uh miller also attended the combine out of high school last year it was really poor in the combine but he was lauded for uh having really good guard skills i don't think those just disappeared out of thin air he just reinvented his game made it work against professionals and that's something i can't stress stress enough being impactful against pros as a 19 year old is really really important and impressive to me so i think that's someone i would really target for the jazz as a wing but also a big He's one of my favorite options. I have him 12th on my latest board, and Noah Clowney is ranked similarly at 16th or 17th, depending how soon you read this, because it, my board is changing. Uh, Bryce Sensabaugh is a bowling ball of a scorer who scores well from the post and the mid-range, but also shot extremely well from deep and the rim. But his game at time lacked the consistency to stand out as a surefire top 15 guy, but he could re return those dividends. Whitehead is a great shooter. Dariq Whitehead can shoot the lights out. He played with nagging injuries. He also reminds me a bit of A.J. Griffin, a Duke Blue Devil a year ahead of Whitehead, who is, uh, had his season marred by injuries, became a spot-up shooter for a Duke team that was very good. Similar things had to Dariq, happened to Dariq Whitehead, but he's one of the better recruits this past year as regarded as a top five by all the services and has an amazing prep career as Montverde Academy. And I like to value those things because I think it matters in the long run. The long run talks about how important this type of stuff is. Like he, like Dariq Whitehead, let me just preface this. I, I don't love saying, hey, I'm going to toss college basketball out. But you got to say someone who had the shooting splits he had in college, but was known for more being a ball in hand mid-range scorer in high school. That means they're more well-rounded than just the college would indicate to me. I don't think it's worth throwing out the high school prep career beforehand. So that's where the draft uh, analysis in me rather than and the college basketball fan disagree with each other. But I think it is value to have both. So those are some ways to keep an eye on for the Jazz at 16. But the Jazz, you know, they'll have a decision to be made. And I'll talk about the third and final strategy coming up next. I'll explain the last strategy, which is taking the best player available at the, regardless of position and rank these strategies based on how I view them pertaining to the 2023 slot for the jazz and explain why and why i think th there are different strategies and one is better than the other but first let's talk about prize picks prize picks is a blast like i can't stress to you enough how much i enjoy placing entries on prize picks um they've got player entries for so many sports i've even made entries in tennis and i will again this year with the french open just being beginning a week from today with qualifications beginning yesterday but if you're listening to this, you're probably interested in the new promotion going on as the NBA playoffs carry on. The NBA playoffs are carrying on and they're, you know, just about oh, uh, into the finals now. Pretty crazy to think about. One prize picks user will win a chance to become a millionaire. One entry placed after 8 a.m. Eastern time every day will be selected. And whoever placed that entry will be giving a six pick flex with the following pants. Six correct picks out of six equals a million dollars. Five equals 80,000. Four correct picks equals 16,000. Full details can be found at prizepicks.com slash million. You must opt in at this link to be eligible for one of the million dollar entries. You must do so. 
once you opt in, all you have to do is play the game like normal, and you could be the lucky winner. Download Prize Picks app or go to PrizePicks.com and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive a 100% instant deposit match up to $100 with promo code LOCKED ON, L O C K E D O N. If you deposit $100, Prize Picks will give you $100 back. If you deposit $50, Prize Picks will give you $50 back. Don't forget to enter code LOCKED ON at sign up for instant deposit match up to $100. Welcome back into Locked On Jazz. The question is, brilliant or redundant? And that's where the beauty can be at the eye of the beholder because drafting the determined best player available can easily lead to picking players who do not fit the need of your team and causes logjam. And that means some of the players you're picking that are young and you you have said these are going to be core pieces, do not get to play and do not get to develop in the way that you foresaw, and some will. So there can be redundancy, but it also can be brilliant. Uh, it can catapult your team's trajectory should you pick two guys and one of them turns into be a superstar. But sometimes people can be deterred from doing so because you already got a guy you're trying to build. So that's where you have to weigh your options. But that said, let me let me talk about the Jazz roster real quickly. The Jazz could be redundant early and often in the NBA draft this year in turn, as the team is huge in the front court with three seven-footers starting last year in uh, Olenek, along with the two cornerstones of the franchise right now, Lowry Markin and Walker Kessler. So what do the Jazz need then? Starting last year were the three seven-footers and then a young guard in Ochag Baji to end the year that the Jazz are high on. You also had Jordan Clarkson. Let's see what happens to him. Colin Sexton is also on the Jazz team, but he's a two-guard. So the only position that's really vacant for the future is the one that was left vacant by Mike Conley when we traded him to the Timberwolves. So that means you've got to take a point guard. So do you take a point guard in multiple picks or are you going to be redundant regardless? So that's why I say that the beauty is at the eye of the beholder because I think that allows you to have many options with these picks. I really do. I think at nine, should you go with a guard, that's more than likely you go with a wing at 16. Should you go with a wing at nine, could you go wing again at 16 and see if you can double down, find two guys that instantaneously impact winning for the Jazz, maybe make a playoff push? Because more than likely, these guards aren't ready to uh, man the ship and be the lead guard for a playoff basketball team. We'll see. Hopefully, I'm wrong about that. I, I, pray, to, I pray I am. But it's just hard to be that way. So let's, uh, let's draw a hypothetical here. What if the Jazz get lucky and take Jairus Walker or Cam Whitmore? And then a player like Leonard Miller or Derek Whitehead or Grady Dick, for that matter, um, are available. Like, it's hard to pass on some of those guys at 16, even though you just got a guy that's going to slot in right at that same spot in between Markinen and Kessler or with them. Like, Markinen's a three or a four. You can guy, get a guy in Whitmore or Walker that's a three or a four. Now, do you not take a guy like Leonard Miller, who I just described to you as someone I'm super, super high on, just because he won't play immediate minutes? even though some of his appeal is that he can play the four and the five. How about Derek Whitehead? There's never enough shooting in size. A six, seven, two guard who can shoot the lights out. Come on, sign me up. Okay. Now you can flip this for the other way. Okay. The jazz select case and Wallace, for instance, at nine. And now Keontae George slips, or how about the jazz are infatuated with another guard? I think this is the less likely. I don't think they double up with two guards, but if, if Keontae George slips, and Casey Wallace or Anthony Black has been selected, or maybe even Osar Thompson, which pushes down another guard. I think there's a very real likelihood that Jazz say, you know what, I don't want to pass on a guy that could be this. And they take a high upside guy there. And because they have multiple cracks of the bat, they have the capacity to do this. This is where the Jazz are fortunate to have so many cracks of the bat in this draft and beyond. So it's not only this draft. Maybe you can consolidate picks in this draft and move up uh, get a bona fide NBA player that's very good uh, uh, to make this the reality. And so you don't have to say we're going to try multiple players because there's going to be redundancy regardless. So I think that's where the Jazz are really fortunate. Okay, now the question becomes, I said I'd analyze which one's my favorite. Best player available has always been my strategy when I make big boards. And so I, I, and, and I don't say that in terms of like, okay, obviously you're going to take the best player. But I try to think of it like upside for a player uh, is my main, main appeal. So my big boards are oriented on star power possibility. And because the Jazz are a small market team, but the Jazz are ahead of the schedule in the rebound with core pieces, I like to think of players that could really help immediately and make a difference 
a true, true difference in the long-term trajectory of the Jazz franchise. So the players that I think can do that are, are mostly wings. I don't think the guards in this draft have that type of capacity. I like Casey Wallace. I like Anthony Black. They're both top 11, top 12 guys on my big board. But I don't think they have as much star potential as some of the wings. So I personally lean towards taking a wing at nine. And if you must take a guard at, at 16, because that's where the strongest part of the draft is for guards in terms of where they're projected. Like Kobe Bufkin is a draft darling. Nick Smith Jr. was regarded as the most talented guard coming into this class that came from the collegiate ranks. Uh, how about Keontae George? Should he slip? How about Jalen Hood Shafina, who is a six foot six point guard. He's the, probably the truest point guard of that quartet of guards. I just mentioned uh, that's, that's interesting to me. So if it were between wing at nine guard at 16 and then guard at nine and wing at 16, I prefer the wing at nine guard at 16 best player available is my answer though. Best player available allows the jazz to pursue whomever they believe can make an impact. And it's going to be redundant regardless. So take a player and even if it means that the short term is sacrifice that you don't have a point guard in the future, maybe that means you get more assets. You got another best player available and another team views it the same way. And you open yourself up to have a chance to get a guy that can run the point guard more so than you trust some of these guys. I don't necessarily think the Jazz avoid taking Casey Wallace or Anthony Black because uh, uh, the wings, there are more of them in the top 10. It'll be if one of the guys the Jazz favor, and I think this would be Jarris Walker, Cam Whitmore, are there, then they take the best player available. I, I would lean towards the Jazz taking a guard at nine still because I think Cam Whitmore and Jarris Walker are gone. I don't know if the Jazz would take Taylor Hendricks over a guy like Casey Wallace. Time will tell in that regard, and we'll see, keep our ears to the door, see if we can figure something out. Where I lean is to is heavily dependent on the Jazz find a guard they adore because if they don't adore the guard, and I mean absolutely adore the guard, uh, I would prefer taking a wing at nine because there are plenty in the fold and then take the best player available at 16 as well. And I'd be pleased with the, one of those guards I mentioned of the quartet at 16. But like I said, Leonard Miller, Noah Clowney, Bryce Sensabaugh, Derek Whitehead are all appealing. So I think 16 is an underrated spot to be in this draft class for the Jazz. Sounds to be a sweet spot for based off. It appears to be a sweet spot based off my board and many other evaluator, evaluators. So, Thank you for making Locked On Jazz your first listen. And for your second, check out Locked On NBA Big Board to hear the latest rumblings on the NBA draft itself from Rafael Barlow, Richard Stamen, two guys I work closely with, and myself to stay tuned. for. Well, you'll hear me there too. And stay tuned to hear me again tomorrow for the Everydayers where I'll tell you about some of Danny Ainge's picks that he's hit on and missed on in similar ranges to where the Jazz are selecting this season. And until then... Have a great day and go Jazz.